It's like going to the candy store and getting a little bit of everything. <laughs> That's the idea. Boom, <laughs> right, green light flash or something. <laughs> How you doing? How are you? Good to see you. It's good to see you too. Yeah, yeah. You Great. know my wife, don't you? Oh yeah, of course. And this is Mr. McCaskey oh, here. Hi. How are you? Yeah. Are we all assembled? I think so. You think so? He's going to introduce you. Okay. All right. This is Mr. Schoesberg. Schoberg. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> I'm horrible at names. It takes me a while. Um, drafted in the U.S. Army. Served in World War II. And some of the locations include England, France, Belgium, Holland, and the U.S. Take it from there, because you know a lot more. I'm going to do something completely unorthodox now. Completely unorthodox. But I guarantee I'm going to get some chuckles out of you. About three years ago, I was talking to a group like this, and the people were very intended, very polite, very absorbent. Anyway, I talked to them. And there are times I get very demonstrative, and I do gesturing. And I said, and if it wasn't for you, if you didn't, oh, I, I goofed it. I said, I said it. I said, and if we didn't win the Battle of the Bulge, you'd be talking German today. And the boy looked at me very politely. He said. Sir, I do speak German. And the whole class start laughing at me, and I didn't know why. He was a foreign exchange student from Germany, and he was going to graduate in the class. He's been here for a year. So guess what? I got my real thrill. A couple days ago, I was to a graduation ceremony at Canisius College. And how he came there, I'm not really sure. I saw, I saw this fellow. His name was um, now I can't. Maximilian. Maximilian Mola. And I says, Max, what are you doing here? And this was two years ago. He says, I'm going to Arizona in the fall, and I'm going to study to be a pilot for Lufthansa air, airplane aircraft. And you know what? I really felt happy. I just felt that maybe everything did turn out pretty nice. So when I look at you people, some of you people are going to turn out to be wonderful people, whether you know it now or not. It's going to happen to you. So whatever you do, keep up the good work. Okay, let's go. All right. How old were you when you were drafted? I had to register when I was 18. Everybody had to register when they were 18. And then what happened to you? And when I became 19, I was drafted. <clears throat> and I had to go to Fort Niagara. They put a uniform on me, gave me shots, and then they sent me to Fort Bliss. And I learned to do all kinds of training there. I ultimately became in the uh, fire control section of an anti-aircraft outfit. I was in charge of getting on the targets. And um, in, in the anti-aircraft, there's 90 millimeters, four 90 millimeter guns that can knock down an airplane. They can knock down that thing that's flying by. See that aircraft there? Hold it up, why don't you? 
This is not an aircraft, this is a flying bomb. And we were fighting an enemy that had much more technology than we did. When we were at Fort Bliss training with bayonets, heaven only knows French warfare, the Germans were training with this stuff. They were developing this. Not only were they developing this, but V2s, which were the rockets, which were the forerunners of our rockets. And this was the forerunner of our cruise missile. Only this was uh, not as accurate as a cruise missile. It, when it flew, when it sent up the air, it had a, about eight feet of fire coming out of it, six or eight feet. And uh, when that engine would stop, it suddenly was not a bomb, uh, airplane anymore. It was a bomb and it would come down in a parabolic arc like this. And it had a warhead here of a, a ton of PNT. And it could destroy, a, it, it could destroy our, our outfit if it, if it ever hit us. Shall I tell us some of the things that... As long as we're on this thing, I might as well get to the meat and potatoes of the whole thing. Our outfit, we were in Paris, and uh, we were told at that time not to get involved with the fighting in Paris after we broke, we broke through Normandy and we got to Paris. And we were told the Free French in the interior are fighting it out with the collaborators and not to get involved. So we didn't get involved, but we were there for 10 weeks. And uh, I got to really see the place. And then October the, in October, the middle of October, we were told to go down to the, um, to the, to Belgium. Belgium and Holland, because they, we were, we, our 8th Air Force had destroyed all the bomb, the uh, port facilities on the um, Atlantic coast, and the only facility that was left was in Belgium, it was the Antwerp, and that facility was better than New York City as far as the equipment needed to take unload boats these derricks and cranes and stuff, and we need that port to bring our supplies to go across the Rhine River because we wanted to get to Germany. So the Germans were sending over these V1s and bombing Belgium, Antwerp. So we were shooting them down. You can see them up here. I'll, I'll give you this girl. Where is it? Here. Where is the thing? <clears throat> okay. They were s shooting these V1s in all these different directions. And we were playing cat and mouse. They were moving their guns, we were moving our guns. And if we'd knock them down, then they'd move them and then we'd have to move. So it was a cat and mouse game going on. This went on for 154 days in the snow and ice in the low countries. This is all considered Belgium and Holland, the low countries. And at that time, we didn't have that place up at Camp Drum where you got all that winter equipment. That's all we had is standard army equipment and we froze like crazy i mean we so i saw the people in belgium running around with uh, wooden shoes so i thought to myself if they're running around in wooden shoes i'm going to get a pair of these wooden shoes i'm going to put them on and we were in a canadian group at the time and the Canadians are running around with these wool socks, these gray socks. So I got a pair of those. And I'm running around with wooden shoes. My battery creator says, hey, Schober, what are you doing running around with wooden shoes? 
I said, sir, I'm not set, I'm not going out for frozen feet like a lot of the guys are, and I made it. So I thought I'd tell you some of that humorous stuff that actually happened, not the gory stuff. And speaking of uh, collateral damage, should we talk about collateral damage? I saw my first collateral damage up in Normandy, and we couldn't break out of the the uh, beachhead. You know, when you think of Normandy, you think like a week, and in a couple of weeks, then we're going to move ahead, and that's it. Not so. We had this little dinky stretch of land, about nine miles deep, and may, I don't know how many miles, 50 miles wide or something, and there we were pinned down. We couldn't get out past St. Lowe. So they decided they're going to come over and they're going to bomb the place. They're bomb St. Lowe. And they bombed St. Lowe with 2,500 airplanes, B-17s, B-24s, B-25s, A-28s, B-26s. The sky was three hours lousy with, all, with planes coming down. And the first planes dropped four smudge pots that around St. Lowe. But the wind came this way, and all the smudge pots moved this way after a few hours. And the last planes dumped the whole load on General Leslie McNair and all our guys and killed a whole bunch of them. That was the first uh, collateral damage that term they use where they shouldn't be using it. <clears throat> Second collateral damage that I know of we had a guy in our outfit that was he couldn't stand to be dirty and ever we got into an area the first thing he had to do was go to the mess hall and grab a big chunk of GI soap and run to the neatest cow cottage. He spoke French, and he, he he would make a deal with the ladies to wash wash his clothes, and he'd give them the soap. So this was great. Well, this airplane come along like this, so this uh, V1. I made a mistake. It's not an airplane. Anyway, I'm tracking this thing, and I'm tracking azimuth. And I'm not moving. I'm not going around like this. I'm not moving at all. But my buddy Marty Foos, he's tracking elevation, and he's tracking fast. So I says, Marty, we're talking on our phones, and I said, Marty, if the captain says commence fire, when it's up like this, we might end up getting destroyed. So the thing is up like this, and. The battery commander says, commence fire, and we fired. We get the first shot, by gosh, and this thing is coming down on us. And I says to Marty, that's it. He's going to get us, Marty. But as he's coming down like this, the wind comes like this, and the thing comes over like this and destroys this cottage that got this bar of soap. So Dupree don't have any clothes. And the guys laughed. These are American soldiers just killed a complete cottage of people. The mother, the father, the whole the whole family's gone. It's just the smudge pots. And the guys are laughing, they're saying, hey Duke, what are you gonna do for clothes? One of the biggest, oh, incidentally, at Fort Niagara, I got this. You know what this is? This is a New Testament of the Bible. And I had it in my shirt all the time, all the time. Not part of the time, not on Sundays, all the time. And I'm not ashamed of it, I'm proud of it. You know what this is? You know what the New Testament is? You know what it is? Anyway, one of the biggest shocks that I got 
when I was in the service, is when I met my first German prisoner, on his belt buckle I saw, Gott mit uns. I thought to myself, you know what that means? God with us. And I thought, I thought God was on my side and you got him on your belt buckle, he's on your side. Am I really making a point? Now it's what should I talk about. I think I got some of the good stuff across. Now what, what can we talk about now? The, the things that don't matter much? The fact that we shot down 125 of these and all these guys here are gone. The last guy, Ed Grisbeck here, a week ago he died. The rest of them, I don't know anybody. Anymore. They're all gone as far as I know. There were so many, so many soldiers in the war that when they got out, they really had no way to tell their families they were coming home. They didn't have the technology we have today. There was no such thing as being able to call on a phone globally. So what they did at the end of the war in 1946 and 45, 46, is they just sent a lot of the guys home on ships. They got to a port and they gave them a train ticket and enough taxi money to get home. And so that's what Mr. Schober did was got on a got on a train, got to Buffalo, got in a taxi, and and came home from there. I got to, I got something interesting. Jeff just touched a point in my brain. When we were coming home, it only took us five days back at that time. Coming over it was 13 days. It was only five days coming. It was a fast trip. Anyway, when we got out of the Hav, um, we were out in the Atlantic, and the Atlantic was different. It was calm. It was not stormy like when we came over. It was calm. We got a, a a radio from our boat. Oh, incidentally, the boat I was on was named the SS Lejeune. Does that name Lejeune ring a bell? Camp Lejeune, the Marine camp in, in the, is it South Carolina? Camp Lejeune, Marine camp. This boat was a captive, cap, captive German ship that we refitted and re christened into a Marine Anyway, we, we were aboard the ship, and we had a, a doctor aboard, which a lot of the boats didn't have. And we got a call off of the Canary Islands that one of our guys coming back got appendicitis, and he needed a dark right, doctor right away. So we had to come down towards the Canary Islands to rendezvous with this other boat. And it was a little dinky boat, I don't know, LST or something. I, they had all kinds of junky boats that they used to send guys home, that they got a hold of. Anyway, we rendezvoused with this, and it was a picnic, because this boat was here, and they threw out, what do they call it, a breach of spoil, this line that they throw out? And then when the boats, the ships, would be so far apart, they sent this cage out for this guy, and they picked him up and they brought him to our boat, and he was got his operation with this doctor here, and he was saved. But the funny part of it was, when we were like this, all our guys were nosy. They had to come over and see it, and the boat was like this. And I thought to myself, Hey, Schober. You better run up here to kind of balance this down, or it's going to tip over. Come on, laugh. <laughs> As if you could balance it. I, I'm kidding you. And you know what this is? This is what you used to put in the window when you had somebody in the service. If you had two people, you get two stars. Three people, three stars. If you're person in service was killed, it was a gold star. What should I talk about? How much time I got? We're going to draw your attention to this big photograph over here on the left. Oh, yes. 
when I, when I mentioned that the servicemen came home and nobody knew they were coming home, they never got a homecoming for all the service that they did, for all the dedication and, and uh, things that they gave to the country, they never got a homecoming. So there's an area here, there's a group in here called uh, Buffalo Honor Flight. And what they do is three to four times a year, they fill a plane, a Southwest Airlines plane from Buffalo to uh, Washington, full of World War II vets, and every vet has a, has a guardian that comes along with them to help them. And it's quite a production that they uh, take it, take all these vets down to Washington. It's a, it's done a no charge to the vets. It's a totally free program, and they get to tour of the tour uh, the uh, World War II Memorial. This is the hat they give you. They get the tour of the World War II Memorial, and uh, the honor flights and honor guards wherever they go. They get to uh, Buffalo Airport. There's an honor guard there. We get to Baltimore, and there was uh, an honor flight and a, and a guard system. Some of the band members have been. To that, right. um, if you were in band and went to Washington with us, we toured the. Did World you? War II okay. yep. And on their way home in in Buffalo, is their homecoming, and the whole purpose there is that was the homecoming that they never had, in the entire Buffalo terminal, Buffalo Airport terminal, because you get back about 10 o'clock at night, is full of friends and family. And so when they return, there's probably four to five hundred people waiting for them to get off the plane. And it's quite a large emotional um, procession of honor yes, guards and ROTCs and cadets and family, friends and family that are giving them their welcome home salute. Jeff is entirely correct. Talk about the full uh, uh, card. The fellas wore this shirt, all of them. You can see on the pictures all those white shirts. And the guardians are the ones with red shirts. Each veteran had a guardian that took care of them the entire day. But I want you to see what's on the back of their shirt. See, so you got to honor your teachers. <laughs> Thank you, Jim. Talk about your, your folk art here. Yeah. yeah. Tell about that. Okay. Let me just tip it up so we can see what that is. <clears throat> Have I got the time? Yeah, sure. But, um, okay. But not real detailed. Okay. When we were in England, we were stationed in the Midlands. And in the Midlands was honeycombed with uh, bases. They were everything imaginable that I just described, like B-17s, B-24s. But we were stationed at the airborne bases for the 101st and 82nd. You probably heard of the 101st and 82nd. Everybody. And before they got there, they were sending over um, the gliders. You know, in, the, in these bases, they're either parachute guys or they're in gliders. And they were sending over these gliders in these big crates. And they were uncrating these gliders and putting them together. And some of our guys had an opportunity to get a ride in these gliders because they didn't have the, the ballast they needed for the gliders. And um, when they start... Myself. You collected them, so Captain. Yeah, they they had all these glide these these cases, crates, and my commanding officer he confiscated one of these. He said it's going to make a good command post, so we dragged that thing from all around England, and then we dra dragged it over to uh, France, and Belgium and Holland. And after the war was over, they start smashing them up and getting rid of them. And I grabbed a piece of the glider, and, or the uh, glider crate, and that's what this is, part of a crate. And I, um, we were guarding German prisoners at the time, and they sent us to uh, Bolbeck, France. It's 25 kilometers out of the Havre, and I, in my spare time, I drew this out for a chessboard. I drew this with a pencil. And I was guarding German prisoners at the time, and 
and I asked one of the guys who was a carpenter at Similoiter if he would carve this for me. And he said he'd love to do it. So this was carved by a German prisoner. And I sent it to my dad. And I said, when I get home, I'm going to paint it and make a chessboard out of it. So this, this was, uh, we were at the, at the close of the war, we were with British 21st Army Group. That's this thing. We were under Montgomery that time. And when we were in England and came to France, we were here in the 1st Army. This is Patton's 3rd Army. We went from the, from the Normandy to Paris, and this is the 9th Air Force. And all these are different places where we were, Fort Niagara, Fort Bliss, Oro Grande, New Mexico, Muroc, Ontario, California, Camp Shanks, Camp Irwin, and now here we go, Santa Maria, California. There we go, Wales. Yeah. Heck. I thought I had Normandy on here. I can't even find it. I'll be darned. Santa Maria, Campan, Fort Bliss, Lake England, Cardiff, Wales. Well, I goofed. I thought I had Normandy on it, but I didn't. guess I didn't. But here is the actual, the actual one. This is actually all the different spots we were located, either training or firing. Let's talk about the guys in your okay. big picture here. Yeah. I'm down here somewhere, right? Here I am. This is me here. The guy next to me is the only guy that deserted my outfit. When we were in Camp Han, California, he, buy, he bought a, a, a suitcase from a guy, and everybody wondered why he wanted a suitcase. Well, he... When we got to New York City, he wasn't with us. He was gone. He lived in Syracuse. He, he skipped the country. He skipped, I don't know. And uh, this is Ed Grisbeck. And he's the only guy with folded arms. Like he was going to say, don't tell me what to do. <laughs> These are my battery commanders here. This is Opperstinny. This is Mikolach. And I forget him. Yeah. Yeah. Upside down, it's kind of registered. He used to, he, until recently, he remembered all the names of all the fellas. If, if this, if this, was turned around, I could just go down it. But upside down, I, I can't quite. Let's turn it around. Just oh, you don't want to name check me out. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> huh? Yeah, no. well, we, we got two minutes left here. So. Oh, two minutes. So let's uh, show some of these. Oh, yeah. Do you want to tell about this here? Oh, yeah. A lady in Belgium sent me a letter. Three years ago. Three years ago. She was a little girl, about eight years old or nine years old, when this went on. And this fell up here. Where is he? Where is it? Where is it, Gertie? What would I be looking at here? Oh, up here. This is the lady. She's now a retired judge. And this fella here found one of these guns, and he's the Burgemeister. He's like the mayor of this area in Belgium. And this is a general, and they decided they're going to make a monument in our, the honor of our outfit. And she wrote this letter 
and wanted the information from me on if they're going to write a book. And this monument is going to be in a forest preserve over there. And I was invited to the ceremony, which is here. This is the ceremony for this outfit. And I was sick with the gout at the time, and I couldn't go. Anyway, this is this is part of one of those V1s. This is the, if you can visualize it, this goes under this tail surface, and the skin goes over this. And this is part of a V2. Where in a V2 could this goes? I have any idea. And this is part of a plane that came down in Holland, one of our planes, and when it came down, the guys thought they were going to be in enemy territory, but we had already captured that area, and they were so thankful that we were there, so I got this as a sample. And what this is, I don't know. <laughs> That's about it, guys. Any questions? Did you explain all about the different symbols on here? Uh, Did you? I tried to. Okay. I tried to. Uh, this is a ME-109 German pursuit ship, oh. and this is a V-1, and this, this I consider uh, the uh, Arizona desert, and this was out in California, outside of Los Angeles with the orange groves and the snow-capped mountains. Uh -huh. This is the Atlantic Ocean. Uh -huh. And this is uh, Belgium. Oh. This is Belgium here. Yeah. And this is my coast. Can you imagine? They cost, called us coast artillery. Where the heck is coast <laughs> artillery in all this m mess? I can't understand it, but that's how backward we were. As far as the and worst. and the significance of all these places is places that you places that we either trained at and were camped at or where we fired, but I don't see Normandy on here. Well, I think you better have it done over. <laughs> no, I, I'm really. <laughs> Let me I see. Must have lost my mind. No, you did not lose anyway, your mind. <laughs> this is the way we would correspond with our parents, like this. This is what they call a V-mail. Awesome. It was censored. Oh. It was censored. Yeah, I have some of that from my family, yeah, and it was blacked out parts very, of it. Very, very strict censoring. Absolutely. Couldn't say yeah. where you were, right? Right. Couldn't, no phone calls. We couldn't nothing. say anything. Not like today when these people are over in Iraq and they're FaceTiming right. and yeah. Skyping. and Skyping no. when she was over no. in Germany. Yeah, absolutely. Pardon me? Bruce Lips sink ships. Well, the people were listening and they didn't want people to know where people were, so they were very um, covert. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I think the kids have to get going in a couple minutes. Those, How many of you are in the band? In the, okay, well, they're going to be performing for us. Okay. So I'm waiting for Mr. Odell wherever he went. I feel that you people were shortchanged. You, like you got the so. <laughs> short version of it all. No, I know, but I'm I, I could right. keep you for two hours, I'll tell you. Isn't he amazing? My hero. <laughs> My personal hero. <laughs> Come on, laugh, guys. <laughs> this was him when he went into the Army. Handsome, Jeff made this book for me. No wonder you married him, Mr. Mr. McCaskey made this book for him. It's got pictures of his army and then pictures when he went to Washington. And it was our son in law that was his guardian. So, this is him? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very 